Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all very much for this opportunity to tell you a little bit about the Boston Harbor Islands National Park uh, and the work of the Boston Harbor Island Alliance. I'm uh, Phil Griffiths, I'm the president of the Boston Harbor Island Alliance. We are the nonprofit partner of the National Park Organization. We do a number of things which I will uh, explain to you. I also wanted to thank a number of people in this room. There's lots of folks here that are really big supporters of the National Park and the Boston Harbor Island Alliance. I've been supporters of the organization for a long time. I want to thank, uh, thank many of you for your, uh, for your support. <coughs> what I thought I would do uh, this afternoon is tell you a little bit about the park, tell you a little bit about the alliance and the work that we do, and then identify a number of things which I see as challenges and opportunities in the municipal harbor planning process uh, that can help the, the Harbor Islands, the park experience, people's experience of uh, this great open space that is right there in their backyard. Um, I don't know, just a show of hands, how many people here have actually been out to one of the Harbor Islands? It's fantastic. So you all know what a wonderful place it is. You've got 34 islands and uh, peninsulas out there that are just spectacular, recreational, historic, cultural opportunities, all within a few minutes of downtown Boston. It really is uh, a remarkable uh, resource. We estimate we have about 450,000 visitors a year that come to different places in the park. So it's quite a big uh, economic engine in terms of tourism for Boston as well. It's a great resource, so I'll try not to just spend too much time showing great pictures about the island. But we've got to start somewhere. I think this sums it up. This is a view of Spectacle Island. Minutes away, worlds apart. That's the tagline that we, we like to use. 15 minute boat ride from Atlantic Wharf in downtown Boston, and you're out on this beautiful island. Five miles of walking trails. The Drumlin there is the, the highest point in the harbor. You get spectacular views of the ocean. But this is also a great case of what I think is just mitigation for development. Spectacle Island many years ago was simply a trash dump. Uh, and what ended up happening is the big, big project, a whole bunch of fill put on top, landscape, now you've got this beautiful park opened up in 2006, 2007. It's a great example of when you have big development in the downtown, how you can benefit local open space. But that sums it up. 15 minutes away, you've got the city in the background, you're out in nature, you're wandering. We also have a huge number of historic resources. This picture is some Civil War reenactment out on uh, George's Island, Fort Warren, Civil War era. It's a great opportunity for the people of Boston, kids of Boston to get out, learn a little bit about history, see some of the things that went on in their, in their backyard in the past. And it's a wonderful resource. Through our partners at the Department of Conservation and Recreation and the National Park Service and the work of the Alliance, we run about 150 free programs every year. So people go out to visit the islands and see Civil War reenactment, uh, yoga classes, fishing lessons, all kinds of things. That's part of the work that we do. But it's a wonderful historic resource. And there's also educational opportunities. Uh, there's programs that we run. We have partners, uh, the Thompson Island Mountain Bound Education Center, uh, folks like Save the Harbor, Save the Bay. There's a lot of people going out visiting all kinds of educational opportunities for children in Boston uh, out on the islands. So it's really a wonderful resource for the entire city. A little bit of facts and figures about the actual park itself. Uh, there's been a state park out there for a long time, formed in the 1970s. Um, as the harbor began to clean up, moving into the 1990s, the federal government said, hey, this really is a, a great resource up here. Uh, geographically, geologically, the, the importance of the park is it a drowned drumlin field. Apparently, we are unique in that sense. That's what the National Park says is really a spectacular resource here in Boston. So they incorporated the state park, which was about 13 or 14 islands, and a whole bunch of other surrounding properties into the national park in 1996. There's 34 islands and peninsulas. Park managers, it's a, it's a little tough when half of your park disappears at high time and low time. It's a different challenge. I don't know. We hope that doesn't happen to the Greenway, but we'll be all right with that. Uh, the, far, the largest island is Long Island, about 225 acres. The farthest one out, the Graves, about 11 miles offshore. And I'm sure everybody followed that we have a new owner of the lighthouse out at the Graves, a little less than a million dollars uh, purchase of that lighthouse. I met with the guy who bought the lighthouse a couple of days. He's a really nice guy. He's just interested in restoring the building and having a place to go visit. No plans for any crazy things out there. And that's what everybody wanted to know. He wants to restore it. He wants to be able to go out and visit with his family. Have friends out there and open it up to the public when it's safe. So there's no, nothing crazy is going on. The craziest part of what we have to deal with is the management plan of the park. I haven't listened to the National Park is actually managed by a partnership of 11 different agencies, all of whom have ownership of properties in the park or an interest in the park. The BRA, the City of Boston, the Park Service, the DCR, Thompson Island, the Trustees of Reservations, the MWRA, the Coast Guard, Boston Harbor Island Alliance. It's a crazy, it's a big group of people 
but we all work together on a park, what it means to be part of a park, and the recreational opportunities that it provides to everybody in the city of Boston. So that's how we manage the whole process, and it works. Our challenge as the Boston Harbor Island Alliance, which is the group that I run, we are the nonprofit partners of the park. So you've got an enormous park. You've got 11 different landowners. We're trying to create a park for the whole city that covers all these islands and all kinds of property in the harbor. Trying to get all those organizations to work together and actually make things happen. That's where we come in. Our Island Alliance is a nonprofit partner. So what, what do we do? We actually raise private money to help the Park Service and the National uh, Park Service and the DCR to invest in park infrastructure. Over the last 10 years, public and private money, about $30 million has been invested in the, in the Boston Harbor Islands. That's visitor centers on George's Island, visitor center on Spectacle Island, pier renovations, uh, redoing Pettix Island, making that available back to the public, the Greenway, the uh, Harbor, the Pavilion along the Greenway, all that, about $30 million has been invested in the last 10 years. So we also raise money to throw those free events so that people who visit the park have wonderful things to do when they're out there. And we also uh, try to make it accessible. It's not cheap to get out to the park running a private water transportation system to get out there. So we try and raise a lot of funds to help kids who might not otherwise get out there and their families may uh, be able to visit the park and take advantage of this. And we do about 16,000 free trips a year. Uh, other interesting thing that we do is we manage those projects. We manage construction projects on behalf of the National Park Service and the NCR. So that construction of the Greenway Pavilion our organization, the nonprofit partner, manage that on behalf of the Park Service and the DCR. So we're actually out there, hands on. It's a unique situation to have a nonprofit organization that is legislated by Congress to manage federal money and build things in a national park. It's somewhat unique uh, in that sense. We're currently working on a couple of projects out on Pettix Island, uh, redeveloping some trails and renovating the historic chapel out there. Uh, so we hope that next summer we will have a new chapel up there, which could be a wonderful place for weddings and events. And perhaps what's most important for the purposes of municipal harbor planning, we contract for services on behalf of the park, particularly the public ferries. So the ferry system that goes out of there, food vendors out on the islands, the retail establishments that are at the, the retail shop at the uh, pavilion, etc. Uh, we manage all of those on behalf of the park uh, through our organization. What does that mean from a planning context? Well, the major, the major important things, I think, for the municipal ha harbor planning con uh, context, the Harbor Islands Pavilion on the Greenway, opened up in 2011, National Park Service Gateway to the park. From Long Wharf North, that's where the ferries go out. The public, the public ferries go out from Long Wharf North. Uh, we also run uh, tours out to uh, the Boston Light and Little Brewster Island from Central Wharf South. I mean, there's a technical name there, but it's the here next to the aquarium. So those are the three areas, and I'll talk a little bit about what happens in each one of those places and how it impacts what's going on in a planning context. So the Harbor Islands Pavilion on the Greenway opened in June of 2011. It's a place where people can get park information, they can buy uh, ferry tickets, and there's a small retail outlet there. Um, it's open from May through about Columbus Day, early May when we start running through to Columbus Day, and it's staffed by National Park Service and DCR rangers. So you've got millions of people that pass through that spot. I don't know, you know I don't have an actual count of them, but there's I don't know, 20 million people that come to Faneuil Hall, and the next number of million make their way down to the aquarium and the waterfront. Most of them are passing right through this area. Just on this side now, we have a beautiful new carousel from uh, that the Greenway Conservancy has put up. So that space is going to be a great, I think, open meeting space where people are going to be drawn to. We think this building is, uh, uh, is actually a beautiful piece of architecture along here along the Greenway. About 85,000 people actually stopped in, went to talk to a park ranger and said, hey, tell me about the islands. How do I get out there? What do I, use? What do I need to know about these islands? That number has gone up 50% each year in the last, uh, since we opened in 2011. So it's becoming a real hub of information opportunities. Occasionally we run special events out there. There'll be you know, activities for kids. There's a, put up a tent and run a few meetings, you know, a special events, that sort of thing happens. I think moving forward, we'd like to do a little bit more of that. We'd like to see that space become utilized. I think the carousel there as well will work with the folks at the Conservancy and really make that a vibrant public space. I think it's a great opportunity. We'd love to see uh, a lot more programs. Uh, one of those, no bathrooms. I don't know how many of those 85,000 people stop and ask where the bathroom is, but it ain't here. Right so there may be others. It's, it's an ongoing issue. Is that good or bad? 
Uh, I think in some sense it's, it's, it's appropriate for it. There should be bathrooms nearby, I think. I'm not sure we're the right place to do it, but I think it's an issue for people visiting all the time to know where our bathrooms are. We have to think about that as a, in, a, in a larger context of planning for the whole thing. I think it's important we've got millions of people down there. Maybe you can get one of those um, those restrooms that yeah. yeah. The one that's outside the city hall. Oh, Coin operating. Coin operating. Right. It, you know, we talked to the conservancy folks. Yeah. The space is planned in the larger context with all the folks at the conservancy, and I think it's the appropriate question to ask. Um, but not necessarily for you to. Uh, and I, I don't think so. Yeah, that kind of thing. Um, and then the lifeblood of what we do water transportation. We have 34 islands out in Mount Hubbard. Getting people out there is the key to what we do. Most of our water transportation comes out of Longmore. We serve Spectacle and George's Island from there, but we also operate boats from Quincy, Hingham, Hull, where they're part of our service, serving um, smaller islands in the southern part, and then Hingham Harbor, camping islands. Uh, there's, so there's a, there's a complete system of things that uh, is going on here. But for the for the purposes of the planning exercise here, the bulk of what we do is water transportation out of uh, Atlantic Wharf in the north. So we run out of there. Uh, uh, Ferries, regularly scheduled ferries to George's and Spectacle Islands, early May through Columbus Day. That's our season. We just finished our season. Uh, 2012, last year, was our highest number ever. We went down a little bit this year because of some weather. We lost a lot of big weekends to, to weather, and both heat and rain actually affect our numbers. It's too hot in July. People want to stay inside in the air conditioning and all that. But we run through the Atlantic Wharf north there about 125,000 passengers uh, a year in that season. 125,000 people passing through there to get out to the islands. Uh, peak months of July and August, it's about 35,000 plus, somewhere between 35 and 34,000 and 40,000 during those peak months. That's up to 17 trips a day, starting at 9 a.m. and at 7 p.m., people coming in and out, traversing through that area to get out to the islands. Busiest single day, about 3,500 plus passengers. Uh, the busiest single day we do is uh, uh, one of the uh, Free Fun Friday sponsored by the Highland Street Foundation, where we run free ferry service, and we get somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 people down there in a day. It's quite a, it's quite a scene when they're all showing up trying to get out on the <laughs> crazy. Um, that number has gone up steadily. It's gone up about 50% since 2009. Averages out to about six to eight percent growth every year we've seen in the last five or six years. Um, uh, this year went down a little bit, but the trend is generally being up, and we would certainly love to see that continue to grow. We'll talk a little bit more about that. We also do, as I mentioned, trips out to Boston Light and a little Brewster Island from uh, Central or South. Those go out Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, basically June through September. Uh, how many people have ever been out to the Boston Light? That's, now that's a better question. That's what we need to get you to do. That is one of the best trips you can offer. You can get out there, you actually climb to the top of the lighthouse and get a spectacular view. Uh, of all of us, it's really quite uh, quite unique. Um, and I'll give a little plug to it. We got a big year coming up in 2016. 2016 is the 300th anniversary of Boston Light, the oldest lighthouse in the country. It's the uh, 200th anniversary. One, sorry, 100th anniversary. No, 200th anniversary of the National Park Service, and it's the 20th anniversary of Boston Harbor Islands National Park. So expect big parties in 2016. Maybe we'll turn that lighthouse into one big candle or something. <laughs> but this is the hub for, for planning purposes. This is what <clears throat> the pavilion and our activity through here is what's critical. So maybe you're going to get to this, but what's working there and what isn't for your purposes? We'll get there too, but sorry, so, some of the, the opportunities that we have. <laughs> opportunities and challenges. So there's a bunch of things that work. We have a, we have a strategic plan for the Park Service, the, deeds, the, the folks out there. We'd love to see the, the number of people riding ferries out there double in the next five years. 250,000 people. Um, that requires a lot of integrated planning, both on the islands and on the land side. There's a bunch of challenges. You've got to have, if we want to get them out there, we've got to have things for them to do out there, places for them to go, investment out on the island so that they actually have a place to go. The biggest challenge in all that is, is water transportation. What works, uh, what works, works for us at the moment is that we are about where we are maxed out on the, the number of people that we can get in and out on those boats in terms of the fleet that we have available to us. Our current contract with our boat vendor uh, expires next year. So we have one more year under our current contract with Boston's Best Cruises, who run the boats out of uh, the, uh, 
and Long Wharf North. 2015, we'll be putting out an RFP for a whole new boat service. That's the process we're going to start talking about an integrated plan, uh, an integrated water transportation system. That's really what we need. We've got boats coming around from the, the T, we've got all the private vendors that are going out there. I think the opportunity to really integrate that water system, that water transportation system, a little better is our biggest challenge. Um, one of the things I'd like to see coming out there, I think it's, I think it's not enough to talk about, if you're talking about downtown development, and you have many impacts and you have mitigation, let's think about how you develop that water transportation system, how you invest in that, and how you invest in better facilities out on the island. I think it's an appropriate context. Look at the example of Spectacle Island. It's a fantastic resource that was made available to the public as part of the mitigation for that big project. And that's a great story. And I think we ought to think a little bit more about downtown development, appropriate mitigation, being investment in the islands and the water transportation system. This is a, an outdoor recreational resource for all those people downtown, it's an appropriate place for us to think about that. A couple of more very specific things. One of the challenges that we have is that ferry service. As I talked about, we have a contract with Boston's Best Cruises, which runs through 2014. That's where our boats go from. There's no dedicated space on the harbor for Boston Harbor Island ferries to go out. We are dependent on those, on those vendors to provide us access to space that they have under lease to the BRA. I'd love to see a situation where we end up as, this is where the ferries go for the Boston Harbor Islands. Have a vendor come work with us to use what's going on in that space. I know it's a challenge for the BRA, but it's something for us to think about. You've got a public use, access to a public park, lots of investment, lots of people wanting to get out there. We are dependent upon the private, you know, the moving around of people and the boats out there. It'd be great to have a dedicated space. I think that would help us planning for the future really to quite a lot. I think there's another challenge. We're, we've set that uh, that uh, pavilion as sort of the gateway to the park. That's where we get millions of people coming by and ask us questions. There's no real connection from there down to where the ferries go. It exists, but you're walking through, <coughs> you get that beautiful pavilion, you say, where's the ferry? And they look over there and there's the Long Wharf Hotel and there's, a, there's some band. It's not clear how you get down to the, ver the ferries. And that sort of visual connection from the pavilion that's where I go. I can see the boats down there. And sort of just designing that in a way uh, that makes that connection for people, I think would be really valuable. You've got different ownerships. You've got the Greenway Conservancy. You've got a cross Atlantic Avenue. You've got a stretch of, I think it's park, uh, Boston City Park Zone with the stretch of land next to Christopher Columbus Park. Then it gets out to the BRA on the wharf. But it'd be really nice for us to be able to have that consistent, visual, unified corridor as a way of really welcoming people out to the park with all kinds of signage and things like that, I think it would be wonderful. That doesn't work very well for us at the moment. People get to that greenway and you gotta point them down there. As everybody, we've talked about this a lot. There's no signage, it's hard to find your way around there. So creating that signage system and that visual corridor, I think would help us a lot. I think one of the other things that doesn't work is that it's a little bit temporary down again. You've got that wooden, um, that wooldn ferry center booth there's no place for people to stand around and wait for those things. So I remember when the Marriott Lawn Wharf folks were in here, they were talking about designing uh, a waiting area. That would be wonderful. I mean, it would be really nice to have a place where people could go buy their tickets. One of the biggest questions we get asked all the time, we want to encourage tourists to go out there take them out there. Can I store my bike somewhere? Can I leave my luggage here? Can I leave my stroke? There's nowhere to put that kind of stuff. If you really want to think about the Lawn Wharf area as a transportation terminal, hub, places to do that where people can go into modal, they can leave things, they can store their bikes, they can store their to get out and take a trip. That would be wonderful. Uh, I think <coughs> working with sort of the, the Long Wharf uh, Marriott and their plans, which are very exciting, like you know, we talked about them the other day, I think it fits exactly what we're trying to do. To me, there's sort of three models going in the harbor. You got this model, you got what's happening on the other side with uh, Boston Harbor Cruises, and then you got Rose Wharf as well where they've got that area. I think this is the least, the least effective of them all. People get out here on a hot day, it's scorching hot out there. There's no sunshades, there's no place to stand. It really can't happen. On a rainy day, they're getting soaked. It'd be nice to have an indoor place to do that. Sort of designing that area. And I think in the long term, dedicating that place so that people know this is where you go to get the heart line on the I think that would be important. I know there's lots of challenges. Some of the other uh, challenges that we talked about, they're, they're obviously group and bus, bus drop-off areas, the same issues, you know, the aquarium has lots of other folks. How do you get big groups of people down there? One of the other things that we think about as well, we're definitely committed to 
the core of our service coming out of here because it's, it's the right location, that connection to the pavilion. We're very open and we'll be pursuing other opportunities and places to embark to get to the islands. Maybe it's best to come out of South Boston on weekends where there's more parking down there. <coughs> the Charlestown Navy Yard, other places that we can get out there. Quincy, all those places. We'd love to see expanding all of those places. Lynn, Winthrop, any kind of place that you want to go and get access. We're encouraging and supporting them. It's a challenge when you get to the other end when 10 boats show up at the same time. Bruce, Bruce can tell you as much as anything when they're all a fairly large boat shows up and there's six other ones trying to get them out. So you got to manage all that access. But from what we said, the more people getting out there, the more places they're coming from, that's what we're all about. We should be encouraging it in the most ways that we possibly can. So I think that's a big difference. The other issue, trash. These are pack it in, pack it out islands. So you come off the island at the end of the day, coming off those ferry boats, they got bags and bags and bags of trash. We've got to figure out something to do with that. You know, there's a there's a cost and implication that, but it's it's a big change. So some of the you know some of the questions are clear and obvious ones, but from what I said, I think there's a couple of clear things. I think from the municipal and part of the planning process, it would be great to recognize the connection between downtown Boston development and the opportunity to invest out in those islands as mitigation for certain things. This is your backyard. This is where people are going to go recreate. We've got hundreds of thousands of people coming through here trying to get out there. I think it's a great thing to think about how we incorporate that into the planning process and really, really push some of that out there. Uh, and I think if we think about uh, subsidizing the water transportation <coughs> system, it's expensive. It costs a lot of money. We've got to figure out how to make it more accessible to people that get out there. It costs a family of four 60 bucks to get out to the harbor. We do a lot of fundraising to try and get uh, people out there for free. Groups like Save the Harbor, Save the Bay are always getting people out there. It's a challenge. We, we want to make it accessible to as many people as we can, figuring out ways to do it. And if there's a way to subsidize it through mitigation, development mitigation, I think it's a great thing for this group. Um, and finally, signage. It's a pretty obvious one. So, a couple things to think about. Uh, I hope that was in but formative. Uh, if you got any questions, I'm happy to answer any questions. But uh, if you haven't been out to the islands again, come out there next summer and join us. Uh, and mark the calendar. June 26th, the best party of the year, Boston Harbor Island Alliance Gala on George's Island. The mayor of Harbor Tower will be there herself. She told me that already. But it'll be a great time. So mark your calendars. We'll send, we'll send it out through the, through the, yeah. through the email list. Bruce. Uh, first, just um, thanks for the acknowledgement on this summit. If anyone, um, would like one more chance to go to the park. Anyone that's here um, on Saturday at uh, 9.30 will be boarding on the Provincetown 2, which is at the World Trade Center, um, for the last of our free trips to the islands, uh, which this year will have brought 7,500 kids out for free um, in, a, in, a, in a different model than the model one, two, and three that, that you talked about. Um, just a couple quick comments that I think that at least we should think about, and just you know, I watch a lot um, of how people go in and out of the park. And I know that one of the limiters that you guys are, are having is actually getting people out as opposed to getting them into the park. Um, if you have a ferry that has X hundred people on it, it's full every day, at halfway through the day, people have to start coming off that island or else at the end of the day, you're going to be trying to put 4,000 people on, on you know, boats that have room for 500. <clears throat> there are solutions to that that aren't radical. You can run an end of the day big boat. Uh, you know, of what some people in the industry might call a catapult boat uh, that has room for 500 or 1,000 passengers. Um, the problem now, too, is a gorgeous boat with room for 1,000 passengers. And then you could not have a situation which does happen during, and if Bill Walker's here, I don't know if he is, but they, they made a point. They, they have a short season, and they have to move folks in to make this work and also to bring costs down over time, you know, the efficiencies. So, you know, anything that we can do to help you guys as you plan, I know that. Um, there's another context, and that's the, you know, friends of the, that's the, um, the, the, the partnership meetings and also um, the advisory committee for the park. But on water transportation particularly, I think there's some things that could really help. Because otherwise you get people going down there saying, I'd like to go today, and they go, yes, and you need to take the 230 It's a back. huge challenge. It's you're really, and it's not. People getting out, and you've yeah. got 20 PKs a year, basically about 10 right. weekends in the summer, where you've got to, you've got to design a transportation system with a boat that can manage your peaks on those days and then deliver regular shirts the rest of the day. And you end up squeezing people. You get down, you get down there late at 11 o'clock and it's on a 
Saturday morning on a beautiful weekend. If you haven't booked a ticket ahead, we can get you out there at 11. You just got to come back at 2. And it's, it's, it's that's, frustrating. That's sort of just, just the last comment. And that sort of shows you sort of the importance of sort of <laughs> thinking about commuter and excursion services in a combined way. Because on the weekends are the time when the commuter Two boats are, not are, are empty. And so they're big enough to do the 500 person run at the end of the day. So it's possible, you know, I mean, I've heard people say, actually, you shouldn't do an RFP. You should just open up the islands. I'm just saying, and that's one extreme, and on the others, you know, there's sort of a one vendor in, and then there's sort of a, you know, a lot of other options. It's a big challenge for you, and, um, and I know that, 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 that we all want to help you. Of course, we don't yeah. want to be the So 2015 is going to be the big year. We've got one more year in our current contract. We're going to figure out, how there's all kinds of options on the table. The, uh, you mentioned mitigation, the you know, mitigation piece. Of the great thing back in the day you know, was the big dig. We had a $12 billion transportation right. project uh, and nowhere to put the soil, actually. So, <clears throat> unless they built a north south rail link, you know, maybe. Uh, <laughs> Not a bigger project. Can't build which, any more islands. <laughs> which uh, which uh, is unlikely to happen. We have to, we have to find a way to, as you say, to try to provide some mitigation to make. Of what you do uh, even easier. Do you have a new mayor coming in? Uh, whatever that may be in January, maybe we, we sit down. <clears throat> Obviously, I'm sure you will as well. Sit down to figure out you know, how you provide that, for that mechanism, you know, for that mitigation, whatever it might be, in order to, to try to you know, make it. You know, I think there's a great opportunity for that conversation and the water transportation conversation that are going to be happening now. Talk about them all together, and how do we create that integrated transportation system that takes advantage of both recreational needs and commuter needs, the whole fleet of boats, shared dock space, working together to get them out there. There's a real opportunity to do that. I think, you know, there's parts of this planning process. How do you put in place some of the tools to help us do that? Really, really but isn't the Harbor Walk somehow part of the Islands National Park? And if so, what implication does that have? Tech, technically, if you look what the National Park Service, what the Congress designated, it includes the Harbor Walk, it includes all kinds of property around, is part of the National Park as it's defined by Congress. We haven't sort of taken that on as a sort of thing, but it does, if you think about the concept, I mean, one, of the, one of the things that we do work, we work very closely with uh, Boston Harbor Association, the sort of summer on the waterfront activity, the Vivian uh, and Julie's organization, which is great, because if you think about programming what's going on in the harbor, providing arts and recreation opportunities. We ought to think about that thing as one as one big whole. Have activities on parts of the Harbor Walk, activities of Christopher Columbus Park, activities out on the islands, and think about them as one uh, one enormous canvas on which you can plan things. I think that's a great so uh, technically it's part of the Does it have any legal weight relative to chapter ninety one of the MHP? The only thing I think it has legally is that we can actually if we choose to the National Park Service could implement could apply regulations and things on there. How activities and I don't think they've ever wanted to do that. And it's in the short term, from a, from a management perspective, a little challenging to think about doing it. Yeah. A little challenging about to do that. But the opportunity sort of encompassing that as part of the whole park and thinking about it as part of the whole park makes a lot of sense. You've got opportunities. Well, as you're looking at the park as a whole, just a quick comment. You know, don't stop at the harbor one. Remember that the legislation allows the federal government to invest in the national park as well. And in fact, when they're trying to figure out how much that should be, investment by the city, by the state, and by nonprofit organizations like at Camp Harborview, where there's millions of dollars, opens up the potential for millions of dollars in federal funds for you, which you guys have to aggressively go after going forward. So you mentioned one of the ferry operators, you mentioned the VRA controlling at least some of the docking locations. How many actors in each of those categories? How many operators are out there today? How many different entities are controlling docking locations? And what's the landscape as people think about? On the on particular, uh, on this area, as I understand, so you've got, we're working for the VR. Uh, this part of the property here is leased by the VR to Boston's Best Cruises. This section in here is leased to the MBTA. Most of this over on this side is Boston Harbor Cruises, um, is, is on this area. But I'm not sure who owns the, the rice. The, the aquarium has this part of the puzzle. Farther down here, you've got Mass Bay Lines and other folks down here. It's a little bit of wild west up there. You are yeah. it's, it's a challenge. You know, the, the other interesting thing, if, 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 uh, if, if we grow and expand, 
they're actually licensed and permitted and everything's in the pocket ready to go to add another 100 feet, I think, up here, out here for Boston West Cruises. That, that's permitted, licensed, ready to go should someone want to invest uh, in doing that. Uh, so it's it's mixed. And one, one of the things that would be really great would be able to see, you know, use the MBTA boats that are coming in here. I think it's the Quincy, Quincy run that comes out of here. MBTA boats on this pier, our boats on here, on that weekend, you know, there should be interchangeable movement in and out. But without a dedicated space for us, you know, it puts us a little bit, we go out to, to bid to find something up, a little bit of the mercy, who's got space that they can give us and how are they gonna prepare, propose to use that with us. We had some space, we said, this is where you go to the national park. It might actually change the game, and allow us to do a lot more things. But it's an interesting, interesting question. I right. want to encourage the use of other places as entree to the islands in Lake Charlestown, as you mentioned, East Boston, South Boston, there we go the ferry service going um, and we also already have on Charles Town. It gets only more people access to that place only to go to this one little camp space downtown. Um, and I know that they did an experiment this summer with a few preachers kids going over to the Harbor Islands from the Navy Yard because mm -hmm. of uh, you know, like the connect them up with the largest housing of the housing project. Yeah, no, it's not it's actually either. And so it's so also it's the National Park Service site there. Yeah. Constitution that should be linking national parks. Exactly, and you have these historic places and different locations. Is that you? Yeah. Finally, what, what is who's your typical visitor? So we have um, we have about four hundred fifty thousand visitors coming up. That includes that much of this includes people go to Deer Island, the end of Ray walk around. It includes uh, World's End down in England. The trustees are that's a lot of people. We found <coughs> surveys. Uh, Two thousand twelve, we did survey. And about 70% of visitors to the park are from Massachusetts. So only about 30,000 that are coming, or 30% that are coming from outside. And we also found that about 60% of those people are repeat visitors. So people are going again and again and again. And our anecdotally, our experience has been: you get someone out there, they fall in love with a million out there. The biggest thing is that hurdle to get them on the boat, get out there that first time. Once they're out there, they're hooked, and they'll go back again one, two, three times. Whatever. But there are about 70% of those visitors come from Massachusetts. So it really is, while it's a national park, it's serving a local and regional uh, populace, which is great. Chris, I'll send everyone an invitation that's on the committee. Okay. You'll put anybody that's, in the, anybody that's in the room, just call State Department and say that you're coming and there's room for you this weekend, Saturday at 9 uh, Drinks are on the roof. Okay, you have a yeah. <laughs> Actually, bring your own trash bag and bring your own lunch and drinks. <laughs> Sorry. I just have a quick question. Um, I'm of course going to answer that. If you talked about um, your financial requirements. Where are your financial resources coming from other than the hope of getting mitigation from development? So our um, we have an annual operating budget for our organization of about $1.2 million, something like that. We manage, we do a number of things on behalf of the DCR and the National Park Service. We actually manage contracts on behalf of them, so that's um, where quite a bit of our operating sort of money comes from because we're doing projects on their behalf. Uh, we do fundraising, private fundraising of about seven or eight hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, one of the biggest sources of income over the last one, it's through that number about thirty million dollars of investment over the past decade. The bulk of that from the private side, about fifteen, sixteen million dollars, was mitigation money for LNG projects out in Boston. So over the course of the last ten years, there was about fifteen million dollars. Uh, mitigation for the two gas pipelines that was given to the Island Alliance to invest in the park. The first one that was done wrong, and then the second that was done. And there was a little bit of that as well. It was a there, first ones were mitigation negotiated, right. and then there was a settlement for an environmental violation. Yeah. Yeah. But it put about fifteen million dollars in, into the coffers, and that money was spent um, on in combination with other state and federal money on the pavilion, uh, the visitor center out on George's Island, which is beautiful now. Some of it on Spectacle Island. Uh, and renovating Pedicide, which is now open, opened up to the public again in 2011. So it's quite a, that's, that was a one-time windfall that was really quite beneficial. We'd love to see that. Happen. Yanni, did you want to follow up to that last question? We've got a room full of people here who are either here out of interest or like and self-interest maybe, in the case of the development community. We talked, you talked a little bit about sort of long, longer range plans and what can be done in the context of the habit plan. What can the communities and constituencies in this room do in the near term to help BHIA, you know, continue its mission? So the Boston Harbor Island has to look here. Everybody's on the mailing list. Chris is going to hand this in. There's, <laughs> there's an awful lot of stuff that we can do. You know, we, as I said, we raise funds uh, to send folks out to the, um, 
Island for Free to run programs. Uh, you can become members of the Boston Harbor Island Alliance. We're a membership-driven organization. Uh, we're doing capital campaigns to help build and invest uh, on the islands uh, themselves. Uh, so you can join us at any time. Uh, islandalliance.org is our website, and we would love to have folks uh, join us up at the tree. As I said, we have a, a big uh, gala in the spring every year that we, uh, uh, in, the, in the late spring that we run. We'd love to have you all out there to join us. Uh, but I do think there are also opportunities. There's, there is so much investment going on out in the islands that people really want to uh, help us invest in the next piece of it from, from anything, from we install water bubblers out on the island up to renovating the chapel. Um, there's opportunities to really get in there and, and change that. So I'd encourage all of you to come to our website, islandalliance.org, uh, get in touch with me at any chance. I'm on the mailing list through here. I'd love to talk with any of you about how to engage more with us and what, and what we're doing now. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm just curious, uh, that $30 million over the past 10 years, how much is straight federal government dollars to park? from Washington, not mitigation money, not central lottery. Uh, most of that was about $5 million for the pavilion. So we've got $5 million. Well, there's also, they, they do invest in smaller projects in the deal, and they have, and there's operating expenses. I'm, I'm just curious. No, it's about, there's about, about $5 million was about for the pavilion. That's what I mean. Right. Yeah. It's, okay. The, a more significant of it is, is private dollars yeah. coming through us and yeah. state investment. We'd okay. love to help you persuade the federal government to invest in the national park. Yeah. In fact, there's a lot of people what there. What a concept. Like <laughs> we'll take you up on that. Vivian? But, but I do think we need to remember that these islands, some of these islands are owned by a state agency and also by city agency. And the ongoing annual budget, it comes through the state legislature, as, as Jack well knows from his previous life. So we need to be sure that there are the dollars also for the rangers and such, and the regular operation and maintenance. And then what Phil's talking about is the additional capital expenditures and such that we need, obviously, from government, also from fundraising and such. But the day-to-day -day operations, we want to keep the pressure up on the state to be sure to fund their, their island. And obviously, the city. Those 125,000 visitors that get on our fairs all land on one of six islands that are managed and run by the DCI. It's basically DCR rangers that are there. And the DCI, the DCI you know, it hasn't been the focus of what they do or now. I mean, they, they have a large territory. Uh, and they, they're, they're fighting this budget battle as well. Right. And the rain talks about the federal government and the lack of resources, but the government in general has left. We, didn't, we, we haven't had revenue for, for 10 years or so. So uh, it's an interesting know. example from the, the recent federal government shutdown. We were one of the only parks in the country that was still open because of the fact that most of the work's actually done out of the ground by the DCR. So while every other national park was shut down, the islands remained open, the DCR staffed them, our ferry operators got out there and we managed to have thousands of visitors over the course of the early parts of October, which didn't happen in other places. But for the next six months, there's one DCR full-time employee of the national park. And to be honest with you, that's where we hoped we would be 10 years in. Um, we're not. And so this isn't on you, all right? This is on all of us at every level of government and also everyone in the room. If it's what you care about, you know, then you need to you know, be there. The partnership meetings are public meetings, but the, but the um, advisory committee meetings are also open. Um, and there's opportunity for people to go in and get good ideas and then start to. There's plenty of opportunities. Resources. And I'll be in touch with all of you through the, you know, the list of folks we got here. As we, as we launch new initiatives, as new opportunities come up, this is a great group of people that are interested in doing this. We'll get everybody engaged in, in the activities with them. So thank you all very much. One final thing we have to ask the question, we need to kind of move forward. I personally see a bottleneck there that's going to create problems down the line. Marriott's closing us in on this end. The Harbor Walk, if you take the Harbor Walk there now, you kind of come to a dead end and you're going to take a right and go again. I think we, as a committee, should do a serious look at the, you know, your center. Either, like you say, either have to be our or move it down. You're going to have 10,000, 20,000 people coming in during the day and the weekend. How do you get around that harbor walk with all those people? I see a bottleneck there at the southeast in the first time. It's just closing in that whole area. Now I notice there's tables and chairs in the beginning of the 
uh, on the front of that. Uh, so, so I think I think as a committee, we should look at that. And like you said, we can go up further, and then down, build a bigger building, have it enclosed. That's fine. I just want to keep them away. All those ten thousand, twenty thousand, thirty thousand people. Really look to maintain, yeah. I know the redevelopment authority maintaining that view corridor and that pedestrian it's pathway to know it. through there between the greenway down to the waterfront, so that is a priority moving forward in any new planning. Because then when you, move, when you start to walk down, you stop the kind of back line. Yeah. And you got to take a right. But the merits closing in the left. And the ferries, if they're coming off the ferries, they're closing in on the left side, on the right side. Yeah. So I don't know. Thank, thank you all very much. All right. Thank, thank you. you.